Placencia cigars. Perfected for more than 150 years. Yours to enjoy now. Welcome back to Stogie Geeks, episode 329. I am your host, Stogie, Stogie Geeks. Woo! That's nice. That, that Tangerine Tonic's doing just well. I am your host, Joe Hozempa. I am finally back. After 62 days, I am in studio with our co-host, Little Doc Kid, Kid from Texas, Mr. Drew Gavin. And right now, Drew and I have the opportunity to interview Noel Rojas. Noel has worked with some of the hottest boutiques in the world. He has helped create some of the most flavorful and sought-after cigars. That is an understatement. Good news for us, Stogie Geeks, is that he has his own brand, Rojas Cigars. It's the king of the small gauge cigars. If you go to stogiegeeks.com forward slash 329, you will be able to click to Noel and catch him on his social media and find out what he's been up to. Uh, Noel, welcome to the show. How are you? Great, thanks. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm in my garage right now, so the background shouldn't be that pretty, but I do have some really beautiful tobacco here on my left. There you go. That's awesome. Look at that. Your tobacco oh, yeah. layer. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Drew, say hi to Noel. Hey, Noel. How you doing, sir? Good, brother. Good to see you again. I just, want well, to, I just want to say, Noel, I had ordered some blue bonnets from Texas, and they're being shipped as we speak. Very cool. Oh, I'm, I'm super I like excited. Them. Drew sent me those, and I was like, I was like, whoa, where did you get these? And then I was like, Noel, I was like, I interviewed him uh, in the beginning of my career here at Stogie Geeks. Um, for you Stogie Geek uh, listeners out there, uh, if you want to hear how Noel got started started in the industry and um, all about his story and all of that and how he began, all you have to do is go to uh, episode three. I'm sorry, Jeepers Crow, episode two twenty six. So you can type in episode 226 or Rojas, Noel Rojas. It'll come up in the search function, and you can hear all about that. But today, I want to talk about, um, you know, his uh, projects that he's worked on, what it was like working with other vendors, and about being the category king of the small gauge uh, cigars. We're going to talk a little bit about the blends, what he's got coming up for upcoming releases, and uh, the future, and maybe if we have some time, a little bit about the industry as to where we are. So, N Noel, welcome to Stogie Geeks. How are you? Great, thanks. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to... Uh being with you guys here today. Um, let me see if you can see me better there. Oh, you're just another thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, Drew, uh, do you yeah. have a question for Noel? No, I was just going to like. No, and say, then you no. always say, yeah. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I said to myself, don't say no, just say yeah. So, no, I would just. Uh, I'm very excited, Noel, about your KSG offering that just came out uh, this year. And uh, I actually went down to, uh, what oh, was that, Michael's. I went down to Michael's over in Euless and picked up a few sticks from uh, Tracy down there and uh, Joe and, you know, just uh, got some of those sticks. And, oh, man, talking about a great stick, uh, along with the statement and with the uh, blue bonnets as well. But, uh, no, I just... Uh, wanted to uh congratulate you on that and just and just let's let's talk about the ksg yeah is that the latest blend that has come out noel yes sir okay uh, that's the latest cigar that i actually make is the uh ksg just on smoking it right now yes sir what it's um so uh when uh when i Start planning on the uh, uh, release of the Rojas line in general sense, right? Um, uh, I, I did took a lot of thinking and, and planning uh, in order to come out with that particular brand. Uh, one of the uh, first thing that I was thinking about was, you know, how to 
uh, what will be the first limited release that I, I was going to do with that particular cigar. So I decided uh, to put aside some tobacco from the very first crop of the uh, Somoto Valley, which is the new region of Nicaragua that uh, I'm using the tobacco from. And from the very first crop, which was a virgin soil, uh, I set aside about 15 bales, a uh, mix between Visos and Ligeros uh, that I wanted to use for the first release. Then I, I looked for a really good wrapper that was well aged. It's an uh, Ecuadorian Habano wrapper, uh, Maduro. And as you can see, for being a Maduro, it actually burns you know, really well. Maduro wrappers, uh, especially the Habano Maduro wrappers. Uh, you have to be careful with, with it sometimes because it doesn't, um, if it's not well aged, doesn't burn uh, razor, char what they call razor char char. Uh, so this is actually from the first crop of the Somoto Valley. Uh, there's some tobacco also from, from other regions of Nicaragua, uh, but it's mostly tobacco from Somoto. And, and the one thing that people summarize in general sense when they're smoking it's uh it's a strong cigar but it's a smooth and it's very creamy so that's uh what i mostly get that's what uh mostly i get people talking about it when they smoke it yeah i've had i so i've had just i've had this cigar uh noel like i said in the last couple of weeks uh i went down and try to get them over at Don's place over there at underground underground, but they were already out of them. <laughs> so then I had to go to Michael's and grab those, but uh, I wanted to get my hands on them. You're definitely right about that. It features a rich and uh, 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 it's just a very rich, creamy uh, tobacco uh, that that's offered in a uh, seven and a half by 38 classic Lancer size. And I'll tell you uh, the, the, the binder and the filler, uh, that uh, gets finished with a five-year-old uh, five-year-old Ecuadorian uh, Madonna uh, wrapper leaf uh, definitely transitions well throughout the cigar. Uh, so in that, and and, and knowing that, uh, so when you set aside the, the the fifteen bales for this, was this was this a project that was already already in your mind that this is where it needed to go? This is where I wanted to offer in this KSG stick. Yeah, uh, I, I knew I wanted to do something with that tobacco from the first crop, uh, special because you know it was a virgin soil. Um, nobody planted tobacco in that particular region before, so mm. that soil was virgin. And there is so many things that goes into that particular soil um, that add to the tobacco that I don't think we will ever be able to get it again just because of the complexity of, you know, all the nutrients on the soil. Uh, that I said, you know, we, we need to set aside at least 15 bales to do a couple of releases uh, after time goes through. Um, I mean, I'm planning on doing releases from, from that particular tobacco 15 years from now. Nice. Or seven years from now, you know, things I, I wanted to make these small batches, release it out, and, and see, you know, seven, ten years from now how that device is going to taste like. So that's nice. the whole thing behind the uh, KSC and the limited releases. Uh, we only made 5,000 cigars. Yeah. Uh, Lanceros, as, as you can know, it's like a Lancero doesn't have too much tobacco on it. So we didn't use that much tobacco to make that 5,000 cigars on the filler, per se. Uh, but it's definitely something really creamy and smooth, and it's going to get better with the time, that's for sure. Noel, um, I, I have a bunch of questions. When, when, when I first interviewed you, um, it, if you were going to go back into a time machine, right? It was March of 2017, right? I began my Stogie Geeks journey as a host here at Stogie Geeks uh, January 2nd of 2017. And I've been on uh, ev ever since. And following you, um, you remind me 
when you do your blending and hearing episode 226 of Stogie Geeks, you, you remind me of, and there's probably three other people that I could name that I would put you into this category, where you do small batches of cigars that are extremely tasty, really complex, and saw after, right? People like search for them, right? They, they go to the, your particular vendors where they're available and they seek after them. And then over the past, and again, exposed to me, let's say calendar year, uh, you've dubbed yourself king of the small gauge cigars. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I think that's very important uh, th there as well. But you remind me of like a scientist when it comes to the tobacco, right? And you. so my quick question, my really quick question is, uh, it's a two-part question. Uh, first is, um, what goes on in your head? when you want to create a blend. So you had this crop of virgin soil. What goes on in your head as far as like the tasting components of what you're searching for? And then my second question is, you mentioned 15 bales, right? Yes. Uh, what does that yield in cigar sticks so that the, the Stogie Geek listener and myself can kind of wrap themselves around like the, the how many cigars does that make just to let the Stogie Geek listener know that if they are interested in this blend like you have to act now because it's not going to be available for you know for a long time because of the demand for your product does that make sense well, what we're using for the uh, limited edition cigars, it's uh, it's just that particular crop from the first plantation. But I mean, the stamens, the blue bonnets, uh, the uh, street tacos that are coming uh, very soon. We will be releasing very soon. Uh, everything is just. It's also tobacco from Somoto. It's just you know the very first crop we got. We put that 15 bells aside uh, to make it, you know, limit the releases as the year passes. Uh, it it does kind of fly uh, out of the chill because with this very first release, we only made 5,000 cigars. Okay. And we're, we're probably, uh, right now, we're, we're probably in a quarter of the inventory. Uh, third quarters of the inventory have been already sold. Um, and people are just reordering and reordering as they try it out because I mean it's it's a really good cigar. I, I really like it. Now, in terms of how many cigars I will be making with that fifteen bells through the years, uh, it, it all depends on the sizes. But based on the smaller sizes we made, man, well, that would be a map that I would have to do real quick. But. <laughs> That's awesome. This is, <laughs> this is Stogie Geeks Classics right here. So, uh, and the reason why I'm asking, just as you're doing your calculations, the reason why I'm asking is, is, is it, be, it, it puts the business model, the fluid business model that you have is to create, it's almost like, like lightning strike events that, that we call within the industry. Like, I'm producing this batch, and there's only going to be X amount of cigars. We're about to get the X, right? And that's it. And then it's going to change. And I think that with that type of consumer behavior, it's going to raise the demand, right, of, holy crap, I better get the cigar now. Like, uh, based on the size weight we made for cigars, so one bale, which is around 100 pounds, that is uh, 45,359 grams. This is awesome. True. Yeah, it is. We ran into an average of, let's say, between Coronas and 50s and, and Alceros, let's put an average of 15 grams. I mean, during the past of the year, oh. 
Uh, per bill, we will be making. Uh oh, he hit the button with his hand. Oh no! <laughs> Call him back. <laughs> there you go. You must have hit the there button is, with the cell phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there you go. So, somebody call me. Oh, okay. That'll that, that'll do it. So we're looking at an average, depending yep. on the weight of the cigar. Yeah. Uh. I would say three thousand two hundred and thirty-nine. Uh, I would say between three thousand to four thousand cigars per bale. Gotcha. Um, it all depends with the blending. You know how much tobacco used from that particular source, which is ninety percent. Usually, I just add a little bit to it if I need to balance it out or add some more complexity to it. Um, but that's an average mm -hmm. for cigars. So that's per bale. So that times uh, fifteen is a forty-five thousand cigars. Yeah. Well, you're better than Matt than me. I have to no. use the calculator. <laughs> I, 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 I uh, Noel, Noel, I can't turn it off. Every time I interview someone on Stogie Geeks, I always try to get to what's in their head for for the blend, right? And like what you're trying to create taste-wise for us, com for for us consumers. And I'm trying to get a handle of the business model of the brand owner of who I'm, who I'm interviewing. Because it changes, right? So if you have 45,000 sticks total over the course of uh, you know, five years, seven years, ten years or whatever, for just this particular blend from this particular uh, harvest of the virgin soil, right? It, you, you, the, the, the demand for the product is sky high. Like, I mean, you know, I, I am like, I, 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 I found myself ordering cigars from a vendor in Texas, underground cigar shop, to get to your consumer because it doesn't even get to us here, me, geographically, who's sitting here in the Northeast. It just doesn't even happen because you have enough demand down there and, and, and away you go, which I think from a business model, it, 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 it creates a fluidity of demand so people are like, wow, everything this guy touches is freaking tasty. Like, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's tasty. Like, I remember I lit up a blue bonnet. I always knew of you, obviously, from being, uh, being in the industry. And then I tasted the blue, and I'm like, Drew, what? Oh, this is amazing. And then I was like, and then I just called Drew and said, I, ha I had a blue bonnet. And he's like, oh, well, that's Noel. I'm like, Noel Rojas? He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, no wonder why. It, it's amazing. You know what I mean? And then there are other sticks as well, and we can get into them and whatnot. But the point of the conversation is to give to, to, for, for us to know, okay, great. We got 45,000 sticks over the course of that, of that particular blend. You have other blends going on. Okay, great. That's awesome. But what goes on in your head, like, when you, what, you, you, you have a flavor profile in, in your head, uh, you know, of what you want it to taste like? Can you take us through that process? Sure. Um, I mean, I will have to start saying that, um, <coughs> Basically, putting aside cigars, uh, I you know I grew up in Cuba under a communist system. A single mom uh, that raised me. Um, we were really poor, and I remember my mom always uh, was kind of laughing at me, saying, "You know, you have a rich man's palate, palate uh, and, and we eat rice and beans every day." <laughs> you know, I was trying to uh, find a way always to add complexity to whatever we were cooking or it was just something that you know i could get used to bad flavors in my mouth and you know what I'm this is since since i was a kid uh i learned to cook uh back in cuba and you know use all type of spices and things like that and you know when i when i think of myself 
and and how I actually do the blends. And this is, you know, that's what I'm talking, go, going back to the, the Cuban thing. It's, you know, I always wanted to feel complexity. I have an appreciation for something that tastes good in general sense. Not just cigars, but food and everything that goes into it. When I think about blending, I think about cooking. It's kind of the same process. Mm, yeah. um, you know, I, I taste all my ingredients independently. You know, I say, okay, this is uh, you know, garlic, uh, onions, this, this, and this. And I start mm-hmm. cooking, I start tasting. I said, you know, I think a little bit of um, uh, cinnamon, for example, would add to it, or uh, black pepper, or red pepper, or so many things that I actually get to taste for the first time here in the States. Um, wow. Since I came in, because I mean, there's so many spices that uh, people in Cuba don't don't have access to, and they don't know, and 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 you don't really know that those flavors actually exist. Um, and you know, it's it was it's it's kind of the same process when when I'm blending, right? Uh, I just taste independent tobaccos, and I say, okay, this is how, for example, jalapa tastes like. This is how Peruvian, and I always since I was in Nicaragua. Uh, I always wanted to try new things and different things, not just Nicaraguan tobacco, but in general sense, uh, Peruvian tobacco, um, Ecuadorian tobacco, uh, Mexican tobacco, German tobacco, Colombian tobacco. Uh, I always wanted to try different things. And as I tried those things, I put everything together in my head and I said, you know what, you know, this particular tobacco from Peru can actually taste really good if we add a little bit spicy and pepper with tobacco from Esteli, or yeah. if I add some um, earthiness and sweetness with tobacco from Condea, or, you know, the creaminess that comes from the Corojo uh, Dominican tobacco that I use from the Reyes family in Dominican. And, and as you, I mean, it's, uh, that's what really amazed me, is how much different flavors and combinations you can actually get when you're blending cigars and when they're blending tobacco um, because this is something so special for me that's another thing that I, I, I will be sharing with you uh, I actually have a product that I'm, I'm, I'm almost nailed down and right now it's some production just working on the packaging and things like that uh, where I want to allow the consumer to have the same um experience that uh blenders and manufacturers have when they're blending cigars and i I created a product that i think is going to be a very revolutionary uh idea for the cigar industry and it's going to change the way people actually understand cigars and prefer to smoke cigars and 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 it's going to mostly help people to understand what they like and what they don't like about cigars and tobacco, you know, sense. Mm. Yeah. I was going to say to that, you know, to that, uh, back in January, well, I, I actually happened upon, I was out going out, uh, you know, scavenging <laughs> cigars. And I was out at Lakewood Cigars back in January on the 18th, to be specific. And, uh, and I just, just happened to, upon your, you had a program there going on, an event, well, you were explaining all these different uh, uh, processes from the from the seedling all the way through production of these cigars, uh, you know, being rolled and and what you're saying right now just kind of it just kind of ring that by, by, back in my mind. So, are you are you doing more of these? I, I called it an education uh, symposium or seminar uh, to the consumer. Uh, is that something that you're going to continue with throughout Rojas uh, Cigars? Yes, it's, that's definitely the core of the Rojas line. So um, what I'm trying to build with my new rebranding of everything that I have been done, um, it's actually set the tone of the Rojas brand. Uh, mostly like uh, the brand that is going to really invest on creating um, more educated consumers. And, you know, the one thing that impressed me when I first came to the state 
you know, I start rolling cigars in the stores, talking to consumers. And you would think that the guy who has been smoking cigars for 15 years, he knows, you know, that actually cigars are made by hand or the way that cigars are made. And, you know, surprisingly, uh, it, some of them don't know. I mean, I, I have been making events, rolling cigars in the stores, and people that have been smoking cigars for 10 years approached the table and said, hey, what is that? Said, well, that's tobacco. And that's what you put inside of the cigar? Yeah. And that's how you roll them? Yes. So they will think that these cigars are made even by hand or, or I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, disinformation out there, per se. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people that doesn't know. So I said, we really need to focus on creating a more educated cigar uh, specialist, not somebody that just know how to light up a cigar, which is the majority of the videos that I have seen online. Uh, I want to be able to create people that at least have 80% or 70% of the knowledge that a manufacturer might have when it comes to judging uh, how a cigar is made, how it tastes, how it burns, uh, the construction, uh, the ash, everything that goes into it. And we're going to be the pioneering company that is going to invest on teaching the consumer everything. So, and it's not going to be like, well, this is why my cigars are so good by my shit kind of thing. <laughs> you know, it's going to be, we're mostly going to just teach consumers and get on sense. I'm not going to tell them that my cigars is better than, I mean, I, I never said my cigars are better than, they're just different. Right. Um, and what I want to teach the consumer is to be able to uh, recognize between a really good cigar and an average cigar uh, by experience and by knowledge with uh, all these educational and products that I will be putting out. So by themselves, they can see the difference between one of my cigars and, you know, against any other cigar that they can smoke up there and see, you know, that they can apply the knowledge to whatever cigar they're smoking and decide whether one cigar is better than the other or not, instead of being uh, influenced by a magazine uh, that is advertising, you know, like an $18,000 uh, ad in a magazine that is telling him that that cigar is better than the other cigar that is stupid, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's a smart move. It's a smart move because if you're not pushing cigars from the magazine or from video or whichever, and you're pushing cigars based upon merit or efforts or complexity of the palate or complexity of the cigars or the superior product, um, it makes you really independent to kind of pivot anywhere you want to when it comes to other cigars, as opposed to saying, wow, you know, we have all these cigars and this is what sells and this is what's good and this is what makes money and we're going to stick with this and then move on. Um, I think it's a great, it's, 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 it's an interesting business model. And that's why I kind of put you in that category of that kind of mad scientist who, who builds something that the people want and the people want to, to, to seek after and then go after and, and, to consume the cigars because one of the lasting components that I've tried with the limited amount that I've had, and again, everything that I have to consume from my, from here, being up in the Northeast, is from me seeking out and going to kind of pull the product towards me and fight for the right to get it, you know, if it's available and all of that stuff. I really think that... Um, you know, it it, it 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 creates a big demand um, f uh, for that. Have you been? You you've obviously been the trade shows. I'm sure um, that there your booth must be busy. It's kind of like if you know about you, then like your customers and brick and mortar shops who know about you, you're like the best kept secret, right? Because people really want to try those cigars and they sell out of them and they and they move off the shelf. Uh, wh what do you do to talk to the people who might not know? Like if you were trying to get like a new vendor or something like that, well, what do you, what do you say? T 
taste this mm. and then you, you let the product speak for itself and if you're interested great and if you're not then I'll, I'll i'll sell it anyway right i think that's awesome <laughs> well i i tell you this uh you know any any type of business and you know sense you know uh you, you have all the steps you have to whoever manufactures it or whoever uh, wholesale it whoever retail it and then whoever sell it to a retail right there, there is a chain um I think uh, you know as, as as important as it is to make a good cigar, you also need a good and a strong dis, uh, distribution point. You know, you need people to go out and sell the cigars, and and in most of the cases, you know, there is a lot of good cigars out there made by boutique companies that they actually they're not in every shop just because they don't have a good distribution channel. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, this, this is all infrastructure that goes in the back end of the business uh, in order to be able to uh, deliver the product to the stores and, and get people talking and selling the cigars to the stores. You know, cigars come from Nicaragua, stay here in Texas, and then uh, it depends on the sales rep or the ability that we might have to get to the uh, store owner and give him one of the cigars to try it out in order to get that distribution on going on. Now, um, I remember about seven years ago when I first started on this business, uh, I was just fresh out of the boat for saying, you know, I was uh, five years since I came from Cuba. So uh, I started on the business, I barely speak the language. Um, my English was kind of okay, not that good. and. Uh, as I was getting into the industry, I started meeting really good people and making good relationships with great people on the industry. Uh, between them, there's one guy that I have a ton of admiration for. It's um, Nestor Miranda, mm. uh, the yep. owner of Miami Cigars. Yep. And I remember, you know, on my first events talking to Nestor, I said, Nestor, how can I get to where you at right now? You know, what, what was the process that you went through? Uh, and Nestor, uh, I love that guy, man. He's, he's always super humble, always laughing, always playing domino. I mean, he's a classic Cuban guy, Cuban-American guy with style. And he said to me, it's very simple. You just take a picture of yourself, give it to your wife or your girlfriend. Tell her that she's going to see the picture for the next year. Get into your car and start driving all around the country selling cigars. <laughs> so th- that that was kind of the uh, advice he gave me: just forget everybody that you know, just leave in your car, start traveling around, and and open all all the accounts that you can open. Yeah. Um, I think that's the model that used to work in the past before social media. So mm. I did that. I jumped in my car. And I started traveling all around the country from Miami all the way to New England, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. I mean, I have traveled the whole U.S. Uh, selling my cigars back in the past with the brands that I have in the past. Uh, I did open a lot of accounts. Uh, there was a moment we have like 250 accounts, uh, 280 accounts. Uh, with my old brands that I discontinued, the the uh, wire guns, I was still and all of that. Uh, but it's not just distribution and 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 uh, you know the machine that goes in the back trying to make sure those cigars get to the consumer uh, to customers. Uh, there is also a communication problem that I have back in that time with the consumer and the brand. And you can open as many brand, as many accounts as you want um, on the bi- business side of it, and you can have the best cigars ever. But it's the message from the brand to the consumer is not clear enough. The consumer has a really hard time understanding what the brand is and want to stand for, and what the brand is doing for him. So my biggest problem was that um, I had some, I mean, some amazing cigars. Still, people look for those cigars and whenever they can get it they get it there's only a few left out there of my uh old brands uh, but i have names that most of the people couldn't even remember you know sabor desteli uh guayacan uh roja reserva um 
And then they were all good cigars, but they, they were just, you know, the same cigars everybody's doing in general sense, per se, and sizes and, and things like that. So it's really for the, it was really difficult for the consumer to actually attach a category or, you know, a way of thinking or a particular um, thing to attach to the brand. <laughs> Uh, that's what I decided, you know, as, as I learned more about the market, because one thing is knowing how to make good cigars. Another thing is knowing how to market those cigars to the people. So you have a clean communication with them. Uh, I started, you know, analyzing what are the biggest companies out there, uh, which is obviously the companies that has the best, clear, simple messages to the consumer to what the brand stands for. Uh, that was when I decided to said, you know, we have to do something different. I have to do something different if I really want the people to understand what I do and what the brand stands for. And that's what I created the Rojas Lab. Um, I didn't want to be all cigar for all people. I didn't want to be the same cigar everybody's doing. So what do you need? You need a, a be the specialist on what particular category of the industry. And you need to have something different. What is the category of the industry nobody wants to uh, specialize or, or be the uh, master on per se? Is this more ring gauges? And the why is because it's the most difficult cigar to make. A regular Bonchero can make 350, 400 cigars in couple in, in a factory a day of a regular cigar over 50 gauge. If it's thicker, like a 70, they can make 450 if they want to. I mean, this, there's so much physical space on that cigar that, you know, in any way that you put the tobacco in, you're always going to get some draw. The most difficult cigar to make are the cigars, actually, that are made on a smaller gauges. And they can only make about 250 cigars a day, especially in Lanceros. So you see the big difference? Mm -hmm. Making a small cigar that is skinnier, that has less tobacco, versus making a 60 gauge, which is a thicker cigar, you can actually make less cigars making Lanceros. And it's only the experienced Boncheros that can actually make that cigar. It's very difficult to make. And there is a process you have to, uh, we have a certain way that we make the cigars that they have to follow that in order to get the cigars made properly. And I said, well, this is what I'm going to uh, specialize. It's going to be a small gauge. Uh, that was the most difficult ta task I ever wanted to do. And, and it, it, it has been a headache, to be honest, to, uh, to get the things done in the right way. I mean, the very first batch of the Rojas, very first batch of the Rojas, which is the Rojas statement, right? Uh, one day I went to the factory and I started checking on some coronas that were made and for some reasons the person that's supposed to check the weight of those particular cigars i mean that one or two days he was sick he wasn't there somebody else was doing it and i said let me check on the production i got about three thousand cigars plot three thousand coronas that they were completely plot and the thing is the weight on those particular cigars, you know, in a 70 gauge, a 60 gauge, you can defend on the weight one, two grams. I mean, you can still get some good draw out of that cigar. But in a 46 gauge, if you're over one gram, you're in trouble. And over or under, so we only allow 0.5 grams per cigar, which is almost nothing, in order to get the perfect draw out of that cigar. So we have to recheck those cigars again make sure we didn't send cigars that were plugged and, you know, make a, a stronger um, system to check on the quality of the cigars when they were coming out of the uh, rollers and uh, in, in order to avoid something like that from happening. Uh, on the other hand, the smaller gauge cigars will always be the cigars that deliver most of the flavors. And this is not just because... I say so, like some people might argue, argue about quality, you know, which is it's, it's a subject that, you, you know, you can say this cigar is better than 
or that cigar is better than it's just what you think um what i always says is uh instead of quality uh i'm talking about physical things that can apply to cigars that no one i mean whoever made the smaller gauge cigars if it if it picked the right tobaccos it always going to be more flavorful than any 60 or 70 gauge or 52 gauge ever and the why is because the same it's a physical explanation that is very simple to understand 80 percent of the flavor of the cigar comes from the wrapper yeah, you guys follow me follow yeah oh yeah me? totally oh, yeah. absolutely yeah. absolutely so, 80% of the wrapper, uh, 80% of the flavor in the cigar comes from the wrapper. Now, the wrapper is always a half leaf of tobacco. With that half leaf, you can roll an Ancero, which is a 7x38, that skinny cigar, mm -hmm. or you can roll a really fat 7080 cigar. Uh, you know, something really fat. Now, the ratio between a bigger gauge cigar versus wrapper and a smaller gauge cigar versus wrapper it tends to be bigger on the percentage of the flavor you get from the wrapper on the smaller gauge because you're going down on the gauge so you can actually taste more of the wrapper and the thing is is the same amount of wrapper you will be using for both cigars is just what is called the overlap so in a seven engage in a 70 gauge uh the overlap of the leaf on the wrapper when you do the turns of the cigar, as mm -hmm. you roll the cigar, you know, the overlap that you see the turns on a 70 gauge, for example, might be like this. When, when you make a 38 gauge, you are getting almost a double wrap cigar because the overlap is really thick. So you're getting the same amount of wrapper, no matter the size of the cigar. And you're getting more percentage of flavor in a cigar that is a smaller gauge. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, with, with just basic physics, you, you're, you're getting double the flavor. Exactly. Yep. Now, the other thing, that's just on the wrapper, right? Now, the other thing is the feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're making a cigar, when you're making a cigar, you pick your visus, your ligeros, your seco. You can make a blend with one ligero, two visus, and one seco. That's four leaves. Right there, you have all the complexity you want, all the strength you want, all the flavor you want, and you're barely in a 48 gauge. Now, you have the ligeros that give you the strength, you have the visus that give you the flavor, and you have the seco that help with the combustion. If you really want the meat, you can just use visos and ligeros. I mean, the combustion, the seco help with the combustion, but if the visos and ligeros are well fermented, they will be burning like gunpowder. So you can actually make a cigar with one ligero and two visos. Could be two different regions of Nicaragua or Ecuador or whatever you want to make it. And with three leaves, you're looking at a 38 to 42 gauge cigar depending on the length of the tobacco the size of the tobacco whether it's you know big leaves medium leaf size small leaves uh it all depends but based on that with three leaves you already have a super flavorful cigar that is going to deliver all the flavor in the world now when you are making cigars and you have already determined the blend what do you do to get to a 60 gauge well there's many ways to do it you can just start adding seco, which is the, the, the tobacco from the lower prime of the blend. That is just going to uh, keep the blend the way it is and add size to the cigar. It doesn't mean that you're getting more flavor, though. It's just, you know, it's, it's a burger that you're just putting that burger into a big bread. You, you, you follow me there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Really? Absolutely. And, 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 so this is a great, a phenomenal explanation of what goes on in your head because you're, 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 you're creating the product and you're, it's in your head as to how they're going to construct it, much like the recipe, how you're going to construct it and how it's going to affect the taste 
for those who, who, who consume it. Exactly. Let's say, and this is a metaphor, right? Let's say you're making a burrito. And you said, I'm not going to make a burrito. And this is for the filler. I'm going to make a burrito and I'm going to use uh, some prime steaks, right? Prime steaks is what half the flavor. So you grill the steaks, you cut the steaks, the little fajitas, you put it inside the burrito. And when you're going to twist it, it's very skin. And you say, you know what? I want something bigger. How can I do that? So you start adding, you know, lettuce, tomato, uh, tomatoes, uh, wherever you can add to the burritos, you know, uh, beans, uh, you know, cheese and all of that, you know, to get a bigger size. As you increase that, you're actually losing the flavors of the, uh, of the steak. Wouldn't you agree? Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and or like a bur- or like a burger, right? So if you compare that to, you know, making a cigar, what is the steak of the cigar? What is what really have the flavors? Which is the wrapper. It, it's exactly. But yep. now we're just talking about the filler. Okay. We're talking about the wrapper first. Now we're talking about the filler. So in the filler and binder, what is the steak? And that's the visos and the ligeros. Ligero for strength, visos for flavors. So once you have the steak, unless you actually want to go to a bigger gauge, then you still add more to it. Uh, but when you have one ligero and two visos, um, one steak, which is, as I said, you know, depending on the size, could be up to a 48 gauge with just four leaves. Uh, you don't need anything else. I mean, if you really want the steak, if you really want to taste the steak, um, adding more of it is not going to make it more flavorful, though. It's just going to make it more of the same. You know what I mean? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Which so, is why which is why when people smoke the cigars, it sometimes is like, eh, it's like whichever blend, it doesn't matter, or brand, They're like, eh, it's just like the so-and-so, or it's just like exactly, this other cigar exactly. and whatnot. As opposed and I tell you, if, if you ever want to make the, the, the what I call the, the Rojas Challenge, the test, get one of my cigars in the smaller gauge that you can find. A 38 gauge, like for example, this one, or any other cigar out there that I make on the 50 gauge, which is the Rohan song. And I smoke that cigar against any cigar on the market that is over 50 gauge. And I bet a hundred bucks that my cigar is going to uh, burn at the same speed or lower. It's going to take you, in some cases, even more time to smoke a skinny Lancero than a 60 gauge. Mm. And the reason is because the tobacco that I put inside these cigars or very thick tobaccos that produce a tremendous amount of smoke and flavor and burn really slow. It's, you know, going back to the physical mass, you know, Bristol right. and Ligeros are the thickest tobaccos. They burn slower. They give you a colder smoke. The second, which is the leaf from the bottom of the clan, which is most of those cheaper cigars as you see online, that steak will just burn fast and doesn't really give you a lot of a strand of flavor or complexity. I mean, that's just, you know, it's, it helps with the combustion, but it's not a tobacco that have the meat, per se. And these cigars are made with what I call the steak of the tobacco, you know, which is filling and binding. And then on top of that, you add the 80% of the flavor coming from the wrapper. You've been able to smoke more wrapper on a smaller gauge than in a bigger gauge. That's why these cigars uh, are so flavorful. And to my um, to my surprise, um, in the back, in the past, uh, when I used to travel all around the states and sell my cigars, you know, you always have the question. You always have people that you're making an event, um, they will come to the uh, the event and they will ask you. Okay, what made your cigars different from the rest of the cigars inside of the humidor? If you add that question to most of the brands out there, even some of the bigger brands, um, they won't have a way to explain a different. Uh, they will just, you know, talk about the quality of the tobacco. Okay, but you know, as consumers, we are all tired of every single product and service we we usually consume on a regular basis, everybody said they have the best product, right? Uh, so it's, 
you you will find some other brands out there not to have an you know a, a, an answer for that particular question saying like I did for example in the past they will ask me okay what made your cigars different than anybody else I mean I can talk about the quality all day long everybody talks about the quality everybody have the same the best wine or the best shoes or the best whiskey or the best you know whoever makes something they said you know they have the best of the best um, but I couldn't say that my cigars were different from the rest because they were not I mean it's I mean they were. In, in a certain way, the way that I blend the cigars, uh, but it's kind of, you know, similar, but not completely different. What we're doing now, which is completely different, the smaller gauges only, is very simple communication between the brand and the consumer. What made your cigars different, which is the question that I get now? Why these cigars are different from the rest inside of that field? Where we make only small gauges. That's mm-hmm. a big difference, number one. And number two, you're going to get way more flavor out of these cigars than anything you smoke out of there. So it's not based on quality. I never talk about quality. I'm talking about the type of product we're doing and we specialize on, which is a smaller gauge of cigars that they deliver the most flavorful that you can get out of the cigar. I mean, that's, and that, and, and that is <clears throat> something that is based on uh, knowledge and physical things that you can actually prove just by looking at it, it's not arguable. And, you know, I mean, you guys know when you go to cigar lounge or the people, you know, that smoke regular uh, cigars on a regular basis, you don't see those guys smoking a 70 or a 80 gauge. You know, most of the guy who really knows about cigars, they don't go over a 52 gauge yep. or a 50 gauge. The people who know, they smoke Coronas. Yep. The... We, uh, this, just this episode, Drew and I did our sticks of the week and, and talking about them and all of that stuff. And a topic that always comes up for me is that I often review, um, sticks that are Toro's the biggest, right? But, um, mostly for me, it's, I love the Robusto. I love the Corona double Corona size, and I completely love to see the blends that are out there in the Lincero size. Like, that, it's, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, if you try this stick in a Lincero, it's so much more tastier than the other one. So almost, I don't want to say every episode, but probably 80%, right, Drew? 80% yeah. of, of, or, or so, it comes up with, with the smaller ring gauge. And yeah. you, you make a great point, right? The consumer who goes into the shop or the, the, the person, the guy or gal who has the smaller ring gauge is the one that really knows. Like, i rather smoke two or three Robustos than one big cigar, you know what right. I mean? And, and because I just truly enjoy the actual taste of the cigar. And, and if you smoke a Robusto or a Corona size or whatever, it should be about the same time. you just got to slow down your cadence. Most consumers think, oh, the bigger cigar, I'm getting more for my money. You know what I mean? They, exactly. they, they and, and, and they're not. And I think you did a phenomenal job of describing how we get those, those taste components. It's knowledge that I'm going to use moving forward when I review cigars f- uh, for sure. Yeah, what yeah we- I, wanted, I wanted to add to that was that when I was smoking the KSG stick, uh, yesterday and actually right now before uh, Noel popped on I just got finished with that you know that stick I mean I was surprised the other day when I and I timed myself I hit my timer and uh, it took me an hour and 20 minutes to get through it and that's with you know going back to the cigar every 45 to a minute and a half you know segment uh, between draws and you're absolutely right I mean whether it was whether I smoked my regular 50 gauge or my robusto size uh, cigars versus the Lancero, uh, I, I was more pleasured at this point with the small ring, uh, small ring gauge size, and I got so much out of it. I mean, this 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 thing put me in a in a euphoria of enjoyment, relaxation. I mean, the 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 uh, the medium, uh, the body, the body of the cigar. Uh, really came through uh, as as what I would think that Noel had in mind for the cigar. And when I talk to others who have already enjoyed uh, KSG, 
uh, or even the blue bonnet or the uh, statement uh, felt the same way with those three lines. They're very consistent uh, with that. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. And as far as educating the consumer, you know, for myself, when I talk to a consumer uh, at a cigar lounge or in, in, in on our social media platforms, you know, they ask, they, I mean, they ask those questions, you know, why is it that we get this better flavor? Why is it that we get, uh, uh, you know, uh, bang for the buck, I guess, if you want to put it that way. And again, you know, like I told them, I said, you know, it, it, again, it's a personal preference, but, you know, with, with, with being that you are really concentrating on small gauge ring uh, uh, cigars, uh, you're really honing in on a, on a, on a product offering uh, that really is well balanced, uh, well thought out. And then from there, it just, it just, you know, it speaks for itself. Uh, if you're a connoisseur or even a beginning connoisseur, I mean, this is a great, this is a great uh, time to take time and, and not really compare, but just think about your overall experience from that, you know, what you're trying to achieve out of that hour, 45 minutes or what have you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Noel. Um, I would love to have you come back and discuss uh, a little bit more. So don't be a stranger. But before we let you go for this interview, I want to talk to you a little bit about like uh, like the future of like where you're going uh, company wise and all of that. Are you looking to keep it with the same business model and you know concentrate really on the the the, the ring gauge size? what you've been doing there or are you looking to uh i don't want to say expand because that, that that's really not a part of the business model but like you know two three years down the road are you looking to make a bigger presence and get those distribution channels a little bit bigger to be a little bit more across or are you going to stick with the same because every time I talk about you to my circle of friends, they're like, oh, those cigars are hard to get. I'm like, well, in this day and age, they're not really that hard to get. You just have to order online through a local brick and mortar. Usually it's in Texas, right? Um, you know, uh, I know you're available in South Florida as well, you know, in there as well. Um, so, like, what are you looking at as far as the future, uh, as far as blends? Or are you going to continue on the same path that you're on? So, um, about that, <clears throat> as I was telling the story about me traveling all around the States and, and you know, mingling with the stores and talking to them about my product, um, I realized something, right? There's so much that you can cover in one day. Uh, I have to have, you know, a couple, 10 copies of myself to be able to, you know, go visit all these accounts and then still live hotels, business stores, and all of that. Still, you know, I was able to open accounts, talk to the store owner, but facing it, facing reality, uh, there's so many brands that store owners have that it's difficult for them to just push one at a time. So I kind of think about it and say, you know what? Nowadays, this is the era of communication, right? It's not like 10, 15 years before. Uh, with social media, we can actually engage directly with the consumer. Yeah. Uh, I can put out a video and hit, you know, or a picture and hit 7,000 people. How many stores I will have to visit, how many events I will have to make in order to reach 7,000 people. I have to be in the, in, in the, uh, uh, out, out there uh, on my car, visiting the stores every single day. So I said, you know what, I'm going to start using social media. And what I'm trying to do, instead of going to the store owner, sell the product to the store owner, and then rely on him passing that information of that product to the consumer and actually engaging directly with the consumer <clears throat> and creating a culture around the brand that the consumer actually goes to the store owner and said, do you know about this cigar? Because if you don't, you shouldn't have it here. And yeah. that's one of the things that I have seen uh, working very well for the Rojas line. 
um, to be honest, on my uh, last trade show that I went to TPE, mm-hmm. I never opened so many accounts like that particular show with a first time uh, being in the show with a brand new brand. Yep. Uh, the Rojas line, I mean, the Rojas line has been out probably for nine months only, less than a year. And I had store owners coming to me and saying, I need to get this product to my store because my consumers, my customers, uh, they're buying these cigars online. And they, they approached me and they said, if you bring this cigar in, I'm going to come here and buy here because I want to support your business. So that's what I'm doing. And it's actually paying better than getting into my car and travel all around the country trying to get, get those accounts open. Uh, right now, we're only focused on Texas because I really want to be strong in Texas first. I haven't really traveled that much. And to be honest, I never sold so many cigars in my life yep. since I have been making cigars. Yep. I uh, think a lot of that speaks to the product too, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's going back to the communication problem. It's a very simple message to the consumer what the brand is and what the brand stands for. If you smoke mild cigars, this is not your brand. If you smoke big fat cigars, this is not your brand. You know, if you use to smoke cigars because you want to prove a status and you buy super expensive cigars, this is not your cigar. This is the cigar for the cigar specialists. This is the cigar for the people who like cigars, unknown cigars. And the one thing that those helps is that most of the people that know about cigars and, and they smoke the cigar, you know, there's a lot of people, for example, in every single store, you know, there's one or two guys that they smoke cigars all the time and the other customers rely on his opinion to buy all the cigars. And those guys, the what I call the cigar specialists, those are the guys that I want to reach. And I want them to try the cigars that I have. So they can tell about the, uh, the rest of the guys in the store about what we do. And the business model that I'm following, instead of spending my money on on advertising, which is really expensive from the tobacco war, and spending my money uh, traveling, trying to hit the jobs. And actually, I want to invest that money on the consumer. I'd rather send free product and you know get a, a, a group of people to do cotton lights and events on, you know, let's say in X shop, for example, in Virginia. Uh, I have one or two friends that, you know, they like the things that I do. You know, I I tell them, okay, get a group of 10 people. I'm going to send you some samples and a bottle of whiskey. You just smoke it and talk to your talk to your um, a favorite, uh, a preferred uh, retailer about these particular cigars. Now you guys know about the cigars. So if you talk to the store owner where you usually buy cigars and you said, we really like this cigar. If you bring it in, we're going to add it to the rotation of our cigars. Right there, that account is open, and it's already selling my cigars. So I, that's that's the approach I'm taking uh, in terms of the distribution. And I can tell you that it's working very well, even without moving uh, from Texas. I mean, I haven't been really uh, traveling out there. Uh, and I got a lot of accounts open at the TPE just because the, the, the store owners came to me and said, hey, man, I need to get these cigars in the store. I got about yeah. five people asking for this cigar. Yeah. And it's really working out for me. I think it's the best model. And that's what we're looking at right now in, in, in the business side of it in order to uh, keep getting those accounts open all, all around the States. Yeah. Um, Branding-wise, uh, Rojas will always be the leading brand on the small gauge cigars, and that's the only thing that Rojas is going to make uh, as the Rojas brand. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do have all the products that I make for the store owners. You know, I'm, I'm all about the small business owners, uh, especially the store owners. Um, and I have several products that I could help them to make more profit than a regular brand product and, and give a better deal to the consumers. Uh, like what we call the custom blends. You know, the Rojas line is all about smaller gauges, but I do make cigars on older sizes uh, for the stores that are as premium as these cigars, uh, as the Rojas line, that are as premium as the Rojas lines. 
and they have a lot of flavor. They're a good cigar made with really good quality tobacco uh, that the store owners can actually make more money. And actually, I gave them some deals that they can pass to the consumers uh, where the consumer also get, uh, you know, a, a best, the best back for the, uh, the best uh, deal for their money when they buy those custom blends. And it's, yeah. it's, I don't have it for all the stores. There is certain, you know, I keep a territory um, respect for the stores that, you know, have a certain distance, distance between them. Uh, but that's another product that we have out there. Um, we don't really talk too much about it because the stores that has it, they keep me busy with those particular cigars, and we can make enough of them. And they're selling better than anything out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and probably you guys have seen, you know, some pictures of the custom blends that I make for some stores yep. uh, oh, yeah. on social media. Uh, but yeah. the Rojas line is always going to be a small gauge. On the other hand, I don't think I will be uh, able to be more than a boutique brand just because of the construction issue with the uh, smaller gauge cigars. So I only have a few rollers that can actually roll smaller gauges. And as we train new rollers, uh, we get better people, uh, better rollers that actually can make the cigars in the way they should be on the smaller gauges. But I don't think we will be able to have, you know, a brand that is going to be more than boutique per se on numbers of cigars sold just because it's very difficult to make these cigars. I and mean, a Ronchero can only make 250 cigars a day on a smaller gauge versus a regular uh, 50, uh, 52 gauge cigar or, or 54 or 56 or 80. Uh, yeah. So in that particular size of the volume of how many cigars we're going to make, I don't think we, we will be more than, we will always be a boutique brand uh, just because of the limitation on how these cigars are made, it's it's very difficult. I mean, most of the people, and is if you ask, that's the number one thing that I get, number one complaint that I get from regular consumers when I talk to them about my smaller gauge cigars. They said, you know, I like smaller gauges, but eight eighty percent of the time or fifty percent of the time that I pick a smaller gauge cigar from another company, it, it's plug. Um, we can we can not smoke it because it's really plug. We can get there through. And this and that because it's really difficult. It's very difficult. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's your experience in general sense with yeah. the smaller yeah. gauge that you have tried before. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And and like I said, you you bring such a a tremendous flavor profile to what I've experienced from your line. Uh, I'd love the chance to say that I've had everything from your line, but I would be lying. Uh, I you know, <laughs> uh, but Drew has, he's been shipping oh, me yeah. some, he's shipped me some, um, and I look forward to, to trying some more. So if I find yeah. two brick and mortars here in the Northeast and put you in touch with them, you, that, that would be okay. Cause I have two brick, and, cause I have two Definitely. brick and mortars that uh, I don't want to say they, they, they always ask me like, you know, who are you, who'd you interview today? I talk to them all the time. Who'd you interview today? Oh yeah. You know, and they say, oh yeah, I've tried this stuff or whatever. And I'm, and I say, have you ever tried New Rojas? And they're like, no, nah. I'm like, I'm like, listen, like you've, you've had some of his other stuff from his other companies and whatnot. And some of the blends they've been about, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like, like if you want a really ultra experience for your consumers and be very special here in the northeast you would be smart to call this guy (laughs) you know what i mean i just tell like like you would be ultra smart like 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 i used to own a cigar shop here in the providence metro just to give you uh idea geographics we're about an hour south of boston right and you know um if i owned a cigar shop like i would have your stuff in there and there are very few interviewees that i would say like 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 the first person i would call would be like because this is a true tobacconist experience for both the brick and mortar owner yeah and for the consumers and like i said i put you on a pedestal with like three people and and that's in that of the whole industry from my experience i've been doing interviews in the cigar industry uh under two capacities, one under Cigar Club Radio, and then one here at Stogie Geeks since 2014. So since 2014, I would say like like, and I would say like, this is a cigar brand you need. The first three calls I would make would be you and two others, and I would be like, that's what that that's where we're gonna start, 
and the other bigger stuff that's advertised, th we can figure that out later. But this is where I would start for sure. So I wonder what are the two others? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if you listen to Stogie Geeks a lot and you watch it, I am absolutely positively a fan of P. Johnson. And I know, it, you know, it, it's like, it's like uh, I, 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 I love Tatuaje. Like, I love Tatuaje and I love Viaje as well. Like, but yeah. but the Twahe would be my 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 first there, and then I would call, and I know it's mass produced, but some of the boutique line that he sells for La Aurora would be Manuela Noah as well. So it would be. I, I love. It, it I would, really like uh, Tadwahe cigars too. Yeah. I mean, there is a couple of them that I really enjoy, and every time that I'm, I'm in store, and I'm always trying to support the local businesses, so I go. And I buy one or two cigars. If they have one of the uh, smaller gauges, I always buy some of them. I, I like them. Yep. Like Fourth, the yeah. cigars. Fourth would be Dr. Gabby Caffey stuff for Caffey cigars. I would also probably do, if I owned a shop, like do a combo with like the coffee, the Honduran coffee experience. Because we've all talked about how coffee and cigars go together and whatnot. But I, I, and, 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 and I would begin there. And... It, it, even even if I were just to open with those four 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 facings like company facings, I know I would do well. Like I know, and there'd be no TV on the wall. There'd be no TV. We we there's no TV at the cigar shop, and and we would listen to uh, uh, old uh, music of of the flavor profile so i'd either have some cuban music in the background or some spanish music in the background or some 50s music in the background maybe 60s music in the background but it wouldn't go past 60s and i'm <laughs> telling you it would work it would work it would work and it reminds me of a shop in dedham mass it's just outside of boston it's it was called uh, courthouse cigars you walk into this old building and you go and he has four chairs and on any given Saturday morning, you would go there. You would have people listening to like the old terrestrial, the the old radio. Usually, it's talk radio, politics. Okay, sure, but it's radio. It's not on the television where everybody's like this, smoking it. They're smoking a cigar like this, right? <laughs> they would stare at the television, and, and, and you would talk, or you'd have a game on, but it would be on on radio. And there would be like twenty guys standing around. People brought their chairs, like for the older guy. You know, say there was four older guys, and the us younger guys would 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 stand around. The 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 older guys would bring their own folding chairs because they couldn't stand for two hours and talk. You know what I mean? And 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 and, and I know it would do well because I know in my heart of hearts. That's what the consumers seek. Uh, I do know that there's a big, there was a big ring gauge boom. Uh, I get it. I know there's a big Nicaraguan boom. I get all the trends. I hear them all the time. Drew and I hear them all the time on Stoy Geeks and all of that stuff. But yeah. I'm telling you, like, if, if, if I started with just those four facings, I know people would come to the shop because it'd yeah. be a true escape from whatever they got going on in their world. Whatever they're doing with their job or the home or whatnot. And I truly believe that when you smoke a cigar, regardless of brand or blend, regardless of region or whatever, it brings you back to that conversation piece and that escape from all the craziness of what's on the TV. Now, I was gonna... and if you want to make it more special, um, you know, one of these days make this particular test. Every time that I'm blending something for someone, got a couple of friends that I make cigars for them private label. Um, if you really want to take to taste a particular tobacco or cigar, you know you have to think on your brain, right? Uh, you can only focus on one thing at the time if you really want to do it well. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, as you said. You know, instead of being watching TV, what I usually do, I just light up a candle, turns all the lights off, so there is not uh, distraction for the mind or for the for the eyes to go to. And if you want to go a little bit further, just turn all the lights off, all the lights off. Use your cigar, your whiskey, whatever water you're drinking. 
on your lighter. Smoke that cigar, close your eyes, and try to focus on the flavors you're getting. It's a whole different experience. It is. I can tell you that it's a whole different experience. Most, uh, the thing definitely. is, you know, if you're distracted looking at certain objects, you know, because your mind, your eyes are always switching, you know, from one place to the other, the attention is really short. If you have a way to just disconnect your mind from everything, you'll be turning off all the lights, just leaving a candle with a very low lighting, so you can only focus on, on what you're tasting. The experience is completely different. Completely different. Yep. Yep, and that, that's why I would create that. Like no TV, no no, the, and 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 even if you have to adjust the hours for no TV and have an old school thing, and 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 I know it would do well. I know, I know in my heart of hearts it would do. That's how my cigar shop was, and the only reason why I sold the cigar. Well, I didn't say I sold the cigar. The only reason why the the cigar shop didn't cease to exist was because my partner was going into another building and he owned the building and then there was another partner coming in and it was i was just like you know something it'd be easier with two instead of three i'm out and 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 and, and that was it and but i know that like uh, people would come and have a good cup of coffee you don't even need a liquor license you don't even need, but not now, you know, it's not a retirement plan, like I, money wise and owning a business and, and I own a business besides, uh, my responsibilities here at story geeks and, 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 and I have a job here at security weekly and all of that, but I know business model that would be its own self sustaining entity. If I kept the prices down in regards to labor and all, didn't have to do that. And I know people would escape from whatever they got going on and would want to go to this place if I had quality stuff where they could smoke it. Because, again, the TV's not distracting them. Conversation is, you know, me looking at you and doing that there and just saying, holy cow, this is amazing. This yeah. time, time is go, amazing. Yeah, every time I go to the factory and I'm down there in Nicaragua, that's what I do. After everybody's gone, factory is empty. I just turn all the lights off. I make some little cigars of different tobaccos that I want to try. Just put some Cuban music on the background. Mm -hmm. Everything is dark. Light up a candle, or just put the light of my phone, you know, against the uh, against the table, just to get a little bit of lighting, just enough to see something. And I just lay back. Enjoy that tobacco and try to get the most I want out of it. And that's, you know, you can always focus on one thing at a time. Yep. I mean, me, particularly me. I mean, I can only work, focus well to do one thing well done, just one thing at a time. And when I do something like that, man, it's just a complete whole different experience. It's, yep. You really yeah. get the flavors. You really get the notes and, and, and everything that goes into it. One now, of, going back. Go ahead. Uh, no. uh, so going back to uh, the stores we were talking about. So even, even before talking to the store owners about the Rojas line, you have 100% support from me. If you can get from each store, let's say you get five of the locals, you know, the regular guy that's always there, the smoke cigars, you know, get five cigars, for, uh, five guys from this store, five guys from the other store. Or if you can get more, more said, hey, guys, you know, there is a brand that he's, he's – uh, Raising the awareness around his brand and, and the smaller gacy guy, which is what he makes. He wants to sell, to send some uh, free samples of cigars with a bottle of whiskey that is made in Texas. The only thing oh, yeah. he asks you is just <laughs> to, you know, make kind of a color light, uh, smoke the cigar, and if you like it, just talk to your store owner and ah. tell them that you're going to put that into your uh, rotation of cigars if they bring it in. It only takes four or five guys to go ask the store owner yep. to bring it in, and they bring it in. They pick yep. up the phone, they call, and they get the cigars. I know two cigar shop owners, and I'm going to do that right away. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to take you up on that offer. I'll call you on your cell and take you up on that offer and do that. And I, and, and, and I know that if I say, like, listen, like, we should get this in, I completely enjoy it. Uh, you should do that. And I did that. And if I were doing number five, and I'm only going to do five because I could go up to ten, if I, I would do Nesta Placencia's blend, the corporate Placencia, like what, what's, what, what, what Nesta does. Because I really believe that his stuff, and again, I'm not a fan of the big ring gauge stuff that he does. But that small stuff he does, what was it, Drew? The Elmer del Fuego, the little, little one, right? Uh, Elmer del, no, El, El Campo. 
Do no, Campo. I, no, 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 no. And with the Fuego, it's a Fuego. It was a red label. It was a Frego. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm almost yeah, 90. Yeah, 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 yeah it was the Elmer right, the Frego. Right. Like, his freaking Corona El it is so good. Like, you know, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, or the Cosecha 146. Like, I'm like, oh, wow. Like, like, I would have, again, I would have those five facings. And I'm sure if we talked for another hour, I'd be up to 20 facings. But, you know. <laughs> but I'm giving you the order. Like, I'm giving you, at least I'm giving you the order, right, of, 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 of what I would do. Like, because I, I would be like, I'm telling you. Like, there's stories to tell. Like, there's so much stories to tell uh, there. So uh, I'm going to be calling you with uh, with those two cigar shop owners for sure. But I want to have you back, like, sometime in July or August if, if, if your time continues. Because sure. um, yeah. I, I want to I wanna continue the series and then do that there. So I'll be in touch with you to actually do that for sure. Very awesome. Cool. Drew, is there anything else you want to say before I take us out? No, I was just going to I was going to ca uh just cap on what uh Noel was saying about his exclusive uh you know I I've, I've been to two cigar lounges that actually No, just one. I'm sorry. Just one. Uh I got introduced to Noel Rojas cigars by his exclusive house uh cigar that he had for a uh uh for Lakewood uh Lakewood cigars. I hope they don't mind me saying that if not they can cut it out. Uh <laughs> No, that's all right. Say whatever yeah, you want. Like, yeah, the Gavito the Gavito family, you know. Uh, you know, and they introduced me to Noel uh, cigars uh, through their exclusive blend, and then from there they're like, if you love that, you're gonna like the statement. And so, yeah, as as my as I've developed a relationship with Noel uh, cigars through as a consumer, uh, I can't say high enough praises than than what I've seen. If you ever have an encounter with Noel Rojas. One of the most nicest gentlemen that you can talk to, speak with. I mean, he takes time. He's not rushed. It's just like when he's when he's developing his his cigars. I mean, phenomenal man to to, to have a discussion with, and uh, you 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 don't get that all the time uh, in in the industry. And not because probably they don't want to. It's just that uh, they just don't they just haven't done that uh, consistently as Noel's doing here in Texas and. Uh, you know, all great things from Texas. Boom. There you they go. Just keep coming. There you go. Noel, please stay on the line when we wrap up because I want to talk to you about a couple of stuff that's offline uh, there. Sure. So, so don't hang up uh, over there. I want to thank you for appearing on uh, Stogie Geeks. Episode 329. Thanks, I want to thank the listeners for listening. I know this was a slightly longer episode. I also want to thank our producer, Johnny, for staying yes. overtime. He's 19 minutes overtime <laughs> uh, from if, if we're watching the clock over there. So I want to say thank you to uh, Johnny for that. And I want to remind the Stogie Geeks that we can keep the conversation going all week long. Go to stogiegeeks.com. Click on the cigars that we've been reviewing. We also got some sponsorship stuff over there. Check out our sponsors there. Uh, I want to remind you that behind every story, there is a behind every cigar, there's a story worth knowing. So shop yes. local and get out there and support your local business. And I want to say special thanks to J.C. Newman Cigars, Havana Cigar Club, Placentia Cigars, and McAuliffe Cigars. Stogie Geeks, over and out. Be safe. Take care of each other. Peace. <laughs>